so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mike DeLaCluse, President of Lessman Instrument Company, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for uh, Hygienic Inventory Management Basics for Liquids and Solids. Today we're going to focus on Level by Weight, and it will be presented by Frank Hovey of Sartorius Intech. Today's webinar will focus on the difficulties of measuring product in hygienic applications in the food, beverage, and pharmaceutical industries. Uh, Frank is a tank, tank and a hopper specialist with over 30 years of experience in weighing applications. His years of working directly with vendors and end users with all kinds of scale products has provided Frank even more insight into measurement applications. He currently works with customers to blend Sertorius process instruments with plant manufacturing systems. Just in case you would like to review the presentation or share it with a coworker, uh, it will be recorded and put up on our website in the next couple of days. We will be muting the phone lines. If you have any questions, there's a question tool built into GoToWebinar. Please send me the question and I'll have Frank get them answered. With that, Frank, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Mike, um, and welcome everybody to this uh, presentation. Um, what I wanted to do this morning was uh, start out with um, a short discussion on uh, hygiene. Um, hygiene is an old concept uh, related to medicine as well, to, uh, as well as to personal and professional care practices related to most aspects of living. In medicine and in home and everyday life settings, Hygiene uh, practices are employed as preventative me measures to reduce the incidence and spreading of disease. In manufacture of food, pharmaceutical, cosmetic, and other pro uh, products, good hygiene is a key part of quality assurance. Um, when we're talking about hygiene, there's a, uh, a concern about how we process products in ways that prevent uh, contamination that can cause uh, illness. Food and food is uh, any sub substance or product, whether processed or partially processed, uh, which is going to be ingested. So cosmetics and medicines and tobacco are not considered food by definition. The um, pharmaceutical would be a, a drug referred to as a medicine or medication, but they're used for diagnosis, cure, and treatment or prevention of disease. These uh, drugs are, are a fundamental, um, well, 90% yeah, of what, what gets done nowadays. It doesn't involve a knife in an operating room, I would say. But the hygienic concern, we all know that food and pharmaceuticals, they can, they can spoil and they produce a risk to humans in the form of contamination. That contamination can be biological, chemical, physical. Uh, from the weighing technology point of view, microbiological contamination is a, is a very major factor. Things that grow in places that can't be cleaned easily. And so uh, food and pharmaceuticals can be contaminated during production. Bacteria and viruses multiply very quickly under certain conditions. That's why so much of uh, these industries exist in giant coolers uh, at low, low temperatures to slow down the, um, the propagation of bacteria. And in doing so, they uh, release substances that make food inedible and they can dis uh, spoil or, or, or uh, derail a process that creates a pharmaceutical product. So <laughs> if they don't want us around, how come they keep putting food out for us? That's the problem in production is that, um, is that uh, there's always places where uh, bacteria and microbes can, can gather. So um, based, because of these things, um, various worldwide government agencies have uh, put into place sets of laws. Um, various organizations have um, created uh, guidelines that work together globally to try to reduce the effects of um, bacterial and microbial uh, contamination of food. And so what we want to do today is just quickly take a, a brief look at what these are and how they affect us. So there's product safety, 
um, the end user product, whether it's the food or medication, <clears throat> the people that the people that um, create the drugs, create the food, you know, their safety, and uh, of course, then there's uh, uh, the after effects, the public at large, because of uh, something that could go wrong. So the world. Health Organization, they are the ones that have come up with this, this mandate. Um, the, the mandate of the WHO is a global strategy. It was formed in 2002, and it was on the reducing of the burden of foodborne disease, which is now being implemented worldwide. According to the global strategy, the prevention of foodborne disease and the response to food safety challenges uh, require a holistic risk-based and timely food and safety uh, policy strategy. So these um, these strategies are for supporting the development of integrated food safety systems, devising science-based measures along with food production chain, and assessing and managing foodborne risks. In pharmaceutical products, it's more common, uh, more commonly known as medicines or drugs. Um, what we have first is in 1968, we have the creation of good manufacturing practice. And that's, that applies to both food and pharmaceuticals. <clears throat> it is GMP that, kind, that, is, that was created by the WHO that kind of rules the roost in the integration of various policies regarding, regarding these, um, these uh, regulations. In 2002, it became the food safety strategy. So the guidelines that, that good measurement practices, or I'm sorry, uh, good, good practices, manufacturing practices came along with was the use of uncontaminated ingredients. In other words, you have to start with good, clean products to prevent contamination of food with pathogens, to separate raw and cooked foods, to cook foods for the appropriate length of time, to store foods at the proper temperature and use safe water and raw materials. And that's kind of what they came up with. You can find, in, in most of these slides, you'll see an area here where you can go and um, get more information based on uh, what we're talking about. So the guidelines were to um, ensure, this is from an equipment point of view, um, the equipment needs to be designed to ensure adequate cleaning, disinfection, and maintenance. Uh, the material itself, whether it's stainless or plastic, it has to be non-toxic. It has to be capable of being disassembled to allow for maintenance, cleaning, and disinfection. And it has to be located for active, uh, adequate maintenance and cleaning. I don't know how many times I've seen tanks like this that are shoved back in the corner and there's no way you can service all the way around the tank, and that creates a problem right there. The um, equipment has to function in accordance with its intended use. Uh, you wouldn't want to use uh, certain screw drives with certain substances as, as they would not be cleanable, um, items like that. Facilities with good hygiene pack, uh, practices, including monitoring. And this is a significant part of the WHO mandate, is monitoring. And we'll be going into that. Uh, briefly, because this drives this monitoring drives some of the equipment that uh, we propose to our customers. Um, in fact, uh, one one or two programs that I've been involved with lately have more to do with monitoring than actual production. It's the accountability chain, and that's why we wound up with uh, several companies. One of them being um, a pharmaceutical company in San Diego last year. It was a very large project. And it wasn't about increasing productivity. It wasn't about accuracy. It was about um, accountability. So the hygienic aspects <clears throat> of weighing technology, the platform scales can have a direct contact with food. And some of the components don't actually have contact with food, yet their presence can influence the, the safety of the product that's being weighed. Um, technical weighing components can be sources of bacterial contamination, whether they contact food or not. And the manufacturer of the weighing technology must ensure that the risk of contamination in the process is minimized. The scale operator must also ensure that contamination in the process is 
minimized by cleaning uh, by the cleaning processes used. Yes, uh, we've seen kitchens like that, haven't we? So, uh, cleaning. These are typical scenarios of various industries and how they do their cleaning processes. Understanding this helps us to understand the, the challenges that we face when employing weight-based measurement techniques in these industries. So, in the dairy industry, they'll use a high-pressure water jet. They'll use high-pressure steam, and then this one here is kind of a this is a biggie. They'll use um, foams that are high in uh, lye content. They'll contain um, sodium hydroxide in large quantities, or they'll contain very strong chlorides. Either way, both of these chemicals, including acids, they attack stainless steel. And so um, if you have an operator that doesn't perform this piece right here, you can have um, lots of problems with metal failure. And uh, when your sensing device is, uh, its accuracy is dependent on the, um, on the uh, integrity of, of the metal used, like the area of deformation in a, um, in a load cell, then that becomes a very big deal. Um, you must ensure that the operators do rinse uh, after they use those chemicals. So the uh, chocolate industry, there's, um, they use a floor cleaning machine. They blow dust around in compressed air. Now, these things here, this, this kind of um, idea, as we'll find also in the baking industry, can not only create um, a scenario where we look at hygienic applications, but also very common it becomes a um, hazardous from an explosive point of view as well. So they'll, they'll wipe things off, and then they'll use a chemical cleaning agent. Again, we need to make sure that when they use chemical cleaning agents on um, actual load sensors, they need to be rinsed with fresh water afterwards so that the residue won't cause damage to the material. Baking industry, they'll wipe with a dry cloth, they'll scrape, they'll wipe with a moist cloth, they'll vacuum, and then they'll sweep and brush sometimes as we'll see in some of the slides coming up. So hygiene uh, has to be managed also in the pharmaceutical um, industry. Uh, what is at stake? It's the safety of the patients, uh, the integrity of the product, and the safety of the manufacturing staff as well. So it's not just the product safety, but it's the people making the product that, that are um, often at risk. So product safety in, the pharm in pharmaceutical production, um, uh, just like food, they, they must use uncontaminated ingredients. They have to prevent uh, contaminating pharmaceutical products with passengers spreading from people. This is, um, this is if, if you've been in these plants, sometimes you're wearing what looks like a, either a, as little as a lab coat and as much as a nuclear suit in some of these places. That's to protect both you and the product that they're working on. Temperature has to be uh, correct, and raw materials have to be safe, and of course, employees have to be um, protected by protective uh, clothing, gear, etc. So equipment needs to be designed to be suitable for its intended use. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry, I often see where they will use um, a, an incorrect type scale for a particular process um, because it's there and they don't have the right item. This, these are opportunities for us when looking at these places to see if they're really using the right items. They need to uh, be cleanable. Um, I find that uh, production areas are typically pretty good in the pharmaceutical industry but um, they tend to get kind of lax on this in the R&D sections, which um, I don't know if that's an opportunity for us or not, but it's something to keep our eyes open for. That they need to minimize the risk of contamination of products and containers during production, and they need to facilitate efficient and, if applicable, validated and reliable ap operation. This validated portion here, this is something that more and more they're becoming aware of, and this is where they're going to be doing a lot of their um, purchasing in the near future is this validation area. 
So um, production and testing equipment needs to be cleaned and sterilized. It needs to be used um, in accordance with written instructions. Um, move to the next slide. Okay, so there's all these companies or all these countries with all these organizations that uh, worldwide influence um, food and pharmaceutical production in such a way to create regulations that different companies have to pay attention to. Um, one of the important things to realize here is that we make products here that go overseas and then of course we all shop at Walmart, right? So what happens in China is a concern. So the IHC is uh, the International Conference on Harmonization, which means basically that what's going on in Europe, Japan, and the U.S. meets the criteria of every other company. So when we're talking about hygienic applications in the United States, guys, it's a global concern. From a consumer point of view, we do care how they do things in Europe because you might be using a medication that was made in Europe. And in Japan, they care about the way we do stuff because uh, we might be making products that are sold in Japan. So. Um, the IHC's or ICH's mission is to achieve this harmonization to ensure that um, everyone is happy with the way everybody else is doing stuff, that we're all on the same page globally with hygienic solutions. I'm not even going to read this slide, and you can thank me later, but it, it reads like it was written by a lawyer. But there's quality guidelines, safety guidelines. Um, efficacy guidelines and uh, multidisciplinary guidelines that are involved in the IHC or ICH rather. So the guidelines are hygiene for production equipment which is where we're involved and these things are covered under the Q7A chapter of good manufacturing practice. Notice that we keep coming back to good manufacturing practice which came from the WHO. Um, there are some websites here that you can come back to at your leisure. Uh, so the pharmaceutical hygiene re, uh, regulations from the same uh, chapter for production equipment. Um, each country organization implements the harmonized standards and guidelines which are being more and more wildly, uh, widely accepted by everyone. So. How are these standards implemented? You have uh, global food management systems, regional audit systems, you have national pharma regulation and regional regulations for equipment. And all of this comes back to the WHO who started this whole merry-go-round back in the 60s. Okay? So uh, which area of areas follow which standards? Uh, guys, guess what? I am not going into any of these. I'm only going here. <laughs> so we have the uh, good manufacturing practices as administered by the um, Food and Drug Administration. We have the ISO 2200 management systems, which covers the accountability. Uh, in some places, they call that, what is it, pasture to plate. These are the systems where um, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. I just recently sold a, um, uh, a batching system to Bob's Red Mill, uh, which is a company based in um, Oregon who makes uh, flour and cookie dough uh, mix, and they make all kinds of food products. They are a company-owned store. Uh, the, I mean, sorry, the company's, the store is owned by the employees. And when I went in there, I was told, guys, we're not looking for ways to, re to reduce the head count or increase productivity necessarily because everybody here that has a job owns a part of the company and they want to keep their job. But what we need to know is if there's a recall on a component, how do we know what lots were influenced by that? It comes back to this. ISO 22000 management system, they have to have in place a quality system where they can track all of their products. So data becomes a very important component to a hygienic system. HACCP is all about safety. 
it's safety um, for the customer and it's safety for the people making the products. The BRC is into certification um, and these are also various certification standards. These two here, NSF and eHedge, are about designs for equipment used in the process. So as you can see, each one of these has a single part to play, but um, they all have a different function. Certification, um, data management, safety, um, and all of it under the uh, good manufacturing practice. So the FDA, um, that's the ICHQ-10, it describes the um, one comprehensive approach to an effective pharmaceutical quality system. Note the word quality system. That's a word that we're going to be coming back to over and over again. Quality systems are employed in ISO certifications such as uh, 17025, um, uh, the 9000 series type certifications for manufacturing. So quality systems are all about accountability and um, a plan and sticking to the plan. So they include applicable good manufacturing practice regulations uh, and they complement ICHQ8 and Q9 risk managements. So these are all about um, where the laws are that influence these. ISO 22000, this is the management system. This is the quality system for um, their objectives are to implement these management systems, uh, demonstrate compi compliance with regulations, and uh, create effective communication between customers and suppliers, and it includes the um, ISO 9001 elements and HACCP system, which is all about safety. So all of this is about blending all of these organizations' goals together. The HACCP is hazardous analysis and critical control points system. Now this is important to know because this involves us. Our equipment is located at critical control points and they need to do this hazardous analysis. So um, there's seven principles of the HACCP. There's identification of hazards, whether it's biological, chemical, to toxic, or physical. These hazards are, are hazards we deal with. Um, physical hazards, you could have um, you could have a auger that has steel components that turn and grind. These can uh, create metal chips that wind up in our food. Uh, not a good thing. You could have uh, lubricants used in conveyor systems to move flour or other products into a, a batch, and that that um, uh, lubricant could be a toxic chemical. You could have all kinds of places where um, food or, or ingestible substances are laid out where they can rot and then be mixed back into the main batch. So this is a, a big deal is, is these hazards. <clears throat> so where, where are the control points? Are they in the formulation, baking, and packaging? What are the thresholds? In other words, what's the um, safe temperature and safe time for baking for products? What are the procedures for monitoring these critical control points? What's their measurement technique? Uh, what are the correctional measures for cases where a point has not passed controls? What are the verification me me uh, measure measurements and um, documentation for validating the system? So the potential risks for HACCP, these create opportunities for us with weighing and measuring equipment. Dosing errors during manual filling can cause safety risks. Dosing, by the way, is German for batching, <laughs> in case you hadn't come across that before. Um, dosing errors caused by inc incorrect formula entries during automatic filling. Uh, dosing errors caused by wing equipment inaccuracies. Uh, this is this is kind of a big deal too because a um, poorly maintained load cell could be uh, being attacked by the cleaners that they use and become inaccurate. Things uh, can become inaccurate due to infrequent 
calibration practices. Uh, errors can be created by binding um, tank and hopper constrainment systems. Um, a lot of times I've, I, I have in many cases seen where uh, people that do the maintenance on this equipment will see something like a, um, a lift-off bolt that looks like it's loose and it's supposed to be loose. They go and tighten it and now all of a sudden you've got incredible inaccuracies in weighing. And then, of course, cleaning problems, microbiological contamination caused by uh, contaminated scales. <clears throat> so these problems can be solved in a lot of ways by, by automating the, uh, the batching process, and we have solutions for that. And there's the documentation of the, do of the dosing process, of the batching process. <clears throat> Our equi equipment can do that, too. And then hygienic design of weighing equipment also reduce these risks. Um, the reason that we're talking about the European Hygienic Design Group, eHedge, is because there really isn't a uh, United States equivalent, and therefore, at this time, um, the eHedge uh, um, guidelines are being adopted by the U.S. marketplace. So um, these are, uh, they help create the um, design principles for hygienic products. They go by a zone concept. You have three zones. The basic zone is where product is stored in sealed containers in places like warehouses. You have um, a medium zone, zone M, where the products are inside of a machine uh, so they can be contaminated by machinery. You have a high area where zone H where product contamination can be done in uh, places during product filling. This is where it's actually open, where uh, something could fall in or it's exposed to the air. Um, materials have to have a certain finish. Uh, these are examples of metal that have microbes, uh, microorganisms growing on them because of the finish being too coarse, it allows a place for these things to dig in. So materials like stainless steel and plastic can be used, but they need to have an appropriate finish. They need to be self-draining so that tilted surfaces are very, very important. They need to be accessible for cleaning um, and maintenance. Um, screws and gaps with slots, those need to be avoided because they create these micro cesspools where biology can form, and uh, they need to have a natural resistance to cleaning agents. Otherwise, they'll get destroyed during the cleaning process. The BRC is all about certification. Um, they, may, they make sure that uh, management is on board, that the HACC plan is actually implemented, and that this uh, quality management, that's data, is, uh, is established. So. Uh, very important is the BRC. Um, then there's the 3A, which is a nonprofit for advancing hygienic equipment. This is a United States organization, very much like the, um, the BRC. NSF is a um, United States uh, nonprofit formed by the University of Michigan. Um, examples of what NSF has done would be like a lot of our products will have NSF feet. The rubber components in the feet are approved for use in food areas. Um, the entire Convex range is NSF approved. So uh, that means that um, there's very little places for water to pool, um, very little places for ingress into the equipment, uh, makes it safer. Here's the relationship of all these, as I already discussed. So you have the FDA, uh, the ICH, and, and they are implementing the World Health Organization good, food, good manufacturing processes, right? You have ISO 2200, and they are make, they're managing the quality system for accountability. You have the HAACP managing safety. Uh, you have BRC certifying that all of these are met, and then eHedge, NSF, and A3, creating engineering standards that this equipment must conform to. So 
the benefits of hygienic design is not just to meet regulatory requirements and keep people safe. There's more benefits than that. You have a low consumption of detergents. You have short cleaning cycles. You have a low risk of contamination and higher productivity and cost savings. So it's more than just safety. Um, products need to have the right kind of finish. They need to be self-draining. You need to be able to get to them. And um, they need to be able to withstand heavy detergents. Here's uh, the Convex line, stainless steel. Uh, these all have the approved finish of 0 0.4 micro, micrometers for any kinds of um, the surface uh, porosity does not exceed that. The IF platform, these platforms were originally designed for pharmaceutical, but um, we're finding a great market in food processing, uh, especially like uh, meat packing plants. These, um, these rails here are not welded but they're folded, and that's a unique design to the IF series. The, these particular ones you're looking at are the electro-polished 316 surfaces, but um, these are available in uh, regular uh, 304 stainless and actually painted steel as well, which wouldn't be for hygienic, but um, they take one piece of stainless and they stamp this entire piece. It's a stamping, and therefore this is not a weld but a fold. And because it's a fold, these, there's these smooth surfaces in there that do not, um, do not promote uh, bacterial growth. So the challenge in tank and hopper would be, uh, here's some examples of how, what you don't want to see. This is like flour that's been accumulating for years and caking on things. You've got syrupy, sticky things coming down. And if it can't be cleaned, uh, then it becomes a a, a, a hazard. Typical load cells used, these are products that you'll typically find in food processing that aren't such a good idea. Um, these bellows here do protect the strain gauge, but you can't clean inside the grooves. Um, this mount and this mount both have many flat areas where water can pool up and be like mini, um, it can be like a, a mini cesspools, I call them. You have control equipment, controls equipment that are like varnish surfaces. They can't use the, um, the aggressive cleaners on these, and also the surface isn't smooth enough to prevent um, microbial production right on the surface itself. So these are examples of where not to, to go with uh, hygienic equipment. So what we came out with was this uh, product here called the Contigo. This is one of several products that we offer. The Contigo uses electro-polished stainless, uh, 316 stainless, and then this is a silica rubber boot that is IP69K. If you look at the um, application here, it actually seals itself to the bottom of the tank and it seals itself to the floor. This can be removed by hand, lifted up the leg, and pulled out of the way and can be serviced inside, but inside is a, um, uh, a load cell that's also rated for um, IP68. So what is IP69K? Here is something that um, you may not be aware of, but IP69K was um, developed by the automotive industry to certify that headlights would not leak while you're driving down the freeway on Autobahn at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> so the test involves a spray of water 10 inches away, about 180 degrees of temperature, and um, it has to have no leaking, uh, no water ingress during this test, and it, and it is tested at many various angles here to make sure that water won't go in. It has to be dust tight, and of course this is a surface sticky test. This is like molasses, this red stuff. They want to see if it drains off. So this, um, this Contigo passed all of those tests with flying colors. It's a pre-assembled kit. You don't buy various components and assemble it. Um, it does have integrated liftoff protection, and it does have um, 
an internal jacking up feature so that you can remove the, the load cell without, um, without a, a crane or a jack just by jacking the, the top plate up. There, um, this cable exit can either be off to the side or it can be out the top so that way uh, this can be a completely sealed assembly in operation. The rubber boot, when it comes up, it has a very special shape as it goes into the machine surface of the top plate and the bottom plate. And this, this shape enables it to resist this high pressure. Inside there's an S cell and all of the Contigos are, uh, they do have, all have horizontal constrainers. They will allow motion in one direction but not allow motion in another direction. But the Contigo um, is 100, 100 kilograms to 2 metric tons. So if you have an application that goes over 2 metric tons, these um, 6202 cells uh, can be used up to 50 tons. They are made of NC316 stainless. They're all accuracy class C1s. They basically are exactly the same um, internal structure as our 6201 cells, so it's a rocker pin design with all the benefits of that, um, but uh, they don't have an area or a surface for microbial, um, where my microbes can attach themselves and reproduce. They have an optimized smooth surface, they're self-draining, and there's no gaps like you would find in a 60 201 cell. Here's what it looks like with the mount. They have uh, these are sold with or without constrainers, so you can still use the the standard constrainment patterns that we use with the 6201s. You have uplift protection here. Um, everything is made to drain. All of these surfaces um, prevent water from pooling up. Even the bottom cup here has a, a drain slot. Here's comparing the 6202 to the 6201. As you can see, this here has lots of areas for water to pool up. So these are good for manufacturing in areas where you're not trying to meet these, um, these hygienic uh, concerns. These are much, much better for areas that are um, a hygienic challenge. Um, the junction boxes use uh, electro-polished surfaces, so they're good in, in, um, in these food and pharmaceutical areas. They also work great even when moisture gets inside. Although we do not want moisture to get inside, they work, can, they work uh, just as well if there's humidity in here as they do without humidity, which is a, a real difference between this product line and other load cell product lines. Um, this is the 60, uh, 5230, and it is actually a transmitter itself. This one here outputs 4 to 20, or it outputs uh, device net or Profi bus or any of the field bus modes, um, and you can put an integrated uh, J box inside. There's no user controllable buttons or anything on the outside, so users can't um, accidentally interrupt what's being done automatically by a remote um, process controller. So this is a, a really excellent solution where they want to package up multiple items and keep all of the controls right at the uh, at the silo itself. And lastly, this is the uh, the Maxis Five process controller. The Maxis Five is um, it prevents uh, inaccuracies due to uh, manual dosing, <clears throat> and it also uh, produces that audit trail that's so needed by the ISO uh, 22000 specifications. And it supports all of the, it is a PLC, uh, unlike other scale products that, are, um, that use proprietary, proprietary scale languages, this, this product does use um, uh, I, uh, ISO or the I'm sorry the ANSI EIC 61131-3 programming language. Uh, therefore, you can get this involved in plants where they want to maintain their own software, and you can give them 
the source code and the tools and they can program it themselves with languages that they already know. It makes it a really excellent choice for places that uh, want to maintain their own control over their processes by knowing the language and being able to modify the language as they go. So that would be our solution to the great um, raft of um, issues created by or challenges created by uh, Hygienic. And uh, that's the, uh, that's the uh, end of my show there. So uh, I'll hand it back to Mike there. All right, Frank, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, ha I don't have any questions that have come up across the screen, so uh, I'll just kind of leave it the same way I always do, and that is if, if any of the people on this uh, webinar have any specific questions, feel free to give us a call at 800-9-LESSMAN, or you can just send me an email at uh, mikeD at lessman.com, and I'll make sure that your, your questions get answered. Uh, we're constantly looking for ideas on other webinar topics, so if any of you have any ideas for either a 101's basic course or a how-to class topic, uh, please email that to me as well, and we'll see if we can pull the right uh, specialists together to, to present that. Uh, at this point, I don't have any other questions, so, so Frank, let's uh, conclude the presentation. Uh, All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, everybody, and uh, hope to run into you from time to time. All right. Thanks, Frank.